This is managing Mac OS without Mac OS, uh, almost. Uh, there are some caveats to that, but that's what we'll touch on today. So uh, just a quick, quick disclaimer. Um, yada, 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 this isn't really legally binding. That anything that I'm going to say isn't an endorsement by my employer. It's not a recommendation of any kind. It's basically just my opinion. So about that, um, my name is Lucas. I am an Apple sysadmin at a finance firm here in Bellingham. If you're from Bellingham, you could probably know that off the top of your head. Anyone big enough to have a singular Mac admin, you could probably know which one I'm, I work at across the street from Y. So I uh, recently relocated <laughs> here um, to the Pacific Northwest uh, from Dayton, Ohio, um, where I worked K-12. Uh, we managed about 900 Macs and about 1,600 iPads in a one-to-one -one scenario. So that was a fun, fun time. I saw a literal example of the dog ate my homework, except the homework was on an iPad. So I feel bad for the dog's mouth. It was pretty rough. Um, and then before that, I did some video production and sysadmin work for uh, an NGO. So it's cool. Um, so the overview of this topic is um, more from a sysadmin who is responsible for managing some number of Macs. So that could be varying depending on, it could, be, it could be five in an art department, or it could be 100 or 200 in lab environments, or any derivation thereof. Where this will start to break down a little bit is when you start hitting the upper thousands and start talking multiple sites, then some of my examples and recommendations, not the recommendations, uh, may start to break down. So uh, my first question is, why would you not want to use Mac OS to manage Mac OS? Um, quick poll of the room. How many in here are responsible for managing some type of end user environment with Macintoshes? Yeah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> the same thing I'm going to talk about here, I run at home. So it's you know very scalable. Um, so my number one reason of why I wouldn't want to run Mac OS is this right here. Um, I don't use, this is, my, this is my statement, I don't use server, Mac OS server. I don't do any of that kind of management on Mac. That's where this kind of talk came about because it just wasn't reliable enough. It wasn't verbose enough. It wasn't scalable enough. And since the XServe died in 2009, I hear everybody, let it go, let it go. That was so long ago. Um, there hasn't really been an enterprise solution. Like, you want to get a, a trash Mac Pro and throw it in a rack and try to make it an enterprise solution, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you a lot of time and money. Um, so why not use some open source tools that are available to us to do that? So why would you not want to use it? Well, time. Take into consider how much time it takes you to do it. Open versus closed. I mean, Mac OS at its core is like half open. Apple says you can look at this half, but not that half. So you can take that into consideration. Um, and then long-term support. Like, I'm a big fan of an operating system and a group of people saying this will be our version for the next so many years and being able to support it through that. And I can work that into my planning and my development life cycles and stuff like that. Um, so these are just kind of the foundational, foundational building blocks of why I choose not to use Mac OS is the main thing I manage Mac OS with. Um, um, I, I'm going to say, like, I'm not the first person to do a talk on this. There are loads of talks on open source solutions um, for Mac OS, um, different tools. Um, this is going to be a very high level overview of what it would look like to walk through the, de the deployment of an asset in an environment. Um, and then hopefully you get something new from it. Um, whether it's a tool or an idea or a workflow or a resource, just hopefully you leave here with something you didn't have before you came. Um, so just looking at it in a logical way, uh, we, get a, we get a client into our environment. We want to we look at its life cycle. So we look at the acquisition, you know, when we purchase the machine, um, what do we do with it when we get it? What do we do to then get it ready to be deployed to the end user? And then once it's in the end user's hands, 
what can we do to get support? So I know I'm not probably I'm probably not the only one in, in here that loves that feeling of just peeling back the plastic off the glass of a new iMac or a Mac Pro um, and that new Mac smell. So <laughs> um, legitimate product from 12 South um, smells just like a new Mac. Um, no joke. So uh, let's just look at that first part, acquisition. So you buy a new Mac. Um, I'm not really going to dig into DEP. I'm not really going to dig in uh, to that level of stuff in this talk. Well, I will say if you are a larger organization or enterprise, that's definitely something. Uh, integrations with MDM and stuff like that is what you can, what you can look at. Um, this is going to focus on the more small to medium sized environments. Um, so three quick free open source tools you can use. Snipe IT, Snipe it. I don't, don't really know how to say it. Um, uh, OS Ticket and Web Help Desk. Um, gosh, I don't even know what version. It, when I worked for the school district, that Web Help Desk version we were running was forever uh, still running on like 10.6.8. And it did, it did its job. Like, it, you know, it did what it needed to do. OS Ticket, I never used it. I've heard really great things. Um, but the main one I'm going to iterate here is um, Snipe IT. I really like it um, as an open source management tool. Uh, it really it acts as um, an assets database, check in, check out, assigned users, LDAP queries. You can assign stuff to users. You can set depreciation schedules. You can. It's really great. They're coming. They're in. They're in beta right now for. I think it's beta, but it's a uh, version four is coming with some really cool new um, tools. Uh, this is one of my favorite things I've done just to keep myself in the organization organized is to be able to say this is when we purchased it, this is how much it was, this is the machine information about it, um, all the fields are customizable, you can print off QR codes if you're into that sort of thing. Um, it's really however you want to make it work. Um, end of life schedules, you can, it's, it's a great tool, it's free, get pull, and it's yours. Um, I mentioned that the new version uh, is uh, coming out in testing right now. Uh, v4, and it has um, a full-fledged API call available for it, too, which I'm super stoked on, um, and I'll talk a little bit about later. So we've gotten the machine. Here's a database. You could use whatever database you wanted. I like it. It's pretty. I can give my manager the link. She's not in here, is she? Yes, she is. Um, and she can look and look through all the assets and say, hey, this is what we have. This is what's deployed. This is what isn't. So we have it in. We have it catalog that's now sitting on our bench. So now we need to talk about the deployment. We need to get that shipped out the door. So um, out of my hands into theirs. So first thing is imaging. Who here still images their Macs? Yeah. Who here does a full gold master image of their Mac still? Nobody. Good. All right, cool. So that was my next thing is uh, the fact that um, imaging is dying or if not, um, a lot of people will say we're already beating a dead horse about this, but because of how Apple ships their machines and the versioning, the version control on the different model years of their systems, um, a lot of people still go with it. Um, so when I say imaging for this talk, um, I'm going to say it in a different, not a golden master type image, but maybe a thin client image or the ability to apply changes to an image of a machine. Does everybody understand what I'm saying when I say imaging? Taking the whole OS, throwing it on the disk, starting from there. Cool. So a really great tool at whatever level you would like to image that is not reliant on Mac OS whatsoever is BSD Pi. Um, Python, uh, it's a net, Apple net boot framework written in Python that can run on whatever. Ubuntu, whatever you want to put in. I'll use Ubuntu for examples because it's what I'm most familiar with and what I've used um, going up. So there's another tool that you can use called Imager. And this tool um, from Graham, Gil Graham Gilbert will actually take, a, take an image and process it um, through the command line. You can have a comp file and ship it off to your NetBoot server um, all without actually, I mean, you don't have to have them obviously be on the Mac for this part. But the BSD Pi and NetBoot um, portion, you don't, it doesn't have to be on a Mac. Um, you're going to start digging into NetBoot and BootP and all that fun stuff. Um, but if you're looking at doing this, you're going to have to look at it anyways. So two really great tools. Um, Imager has three other smaller tools that have broken off from it. 
all of the things that I'm saying are going to be referenced at the end of the end of the deck, and will all be linked. So I'll post these slides um, on this talk. I just wanted to wait till I was all the way done before I did it, um, and then you can go through and see all the different tools and go to their GitHub's or their blog posts or whatever. So. Um, Thin imaging seems to be the way things are going for now, uh, not completely replacing the entirety of the operating system, but applying a set of packages or installer packages that will make only the needed changes to the client machine, um, and then point it to a repository to then finish the updates or downloads or Apple updates. Uh, depending on your environment, um, you know you could be as flexible with this as you want. In my context, I like slash it's urged to have some kind of log or be able to reiterate what patches, what got installed, what Apple software updates got installed on what machines with. So again, it's all contextual, what works for you, what's required for you. Um, and this can be applied in a couple of different ways. Um, you could use an MDM, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, an open source MDM that's in the works right now. Uh, I'll just touch on it a little bit later. Uh, high touch, you can manually install these packages on every machine. You can help you if you're still using ARD. Um, go into ARD and push your packages out through Apple Remote Desktop. Or a thin imaging, which acts as a netboot server as if you were going to do a thick image, but really only applies a few little changes. Um, so, it, big image, you know, gold master imaging versus thin imaging. That's a philosophical conversation for a beer later, not right now, um, but Gold Master's dying. So. Um, so we have the machines ready to go. They're prepped. We hand them off to the client. So now we have to go into the support section of what can we do to make sure that the apps stay updated, uh, apps remain available, things get installed. So really, in this talk, the first two points are only about 20% of what this looks like. So <laughs> software deployment. Um, I am a huge fan of Monkey. Does anybody in here who manages Macs use Monkey? Any Monkey, a little bit, play with it. Okay, cool. So this is an incredible, incredible tool. Um, I've been using it. We use it at the school district. It's, it's awesome. So it was written a while ago by a man named Greg. Greg Nagel, he works for Walt Disney Animation Studios. So his Git is WDAS slash, um, and he has a couple different projects in there. So that's the Walt Disney Studios Animation Git where you can find a lot of this. And then Monkey has its own now, so it's Monkey Monkey um, on Git. Um, Monkey is a, it's hard to explain if you've never heard of it before. It's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an application deployment. Um, it, it's, the tools that reside on the clients are uh, all Python, Python-driven, um, all open source. Um, and then the repository of applications that would sit on a server are just that. It's just a, it can just be looked at as a flat set of folders and files and key lists. Um, this isn't going to be a monkey talk. I will talk for a while on it. And I can talk much longer uh, to its effect afterwards if you'd like to know about it. There's, again, tons of great talks on YouTube um, about Monkey and how it works and how to implement it. Excuse me. It's extremely verbose. Like, I, I love it um, for an open source tool. Um, again, server side, uh, an example that you can use is you can have a 1604 um, server sitting out there with the files that you want deployed and then just front it with Nginx or whatever. Like, it's just, it can just be a web server. It doesn't have to be anything. Um, too fancy at all. Um, in fact, if I'm doing it, it's probably not very fancy. Um, so you'll have your client running Monkey, which appears to them as an application called Managed Software Center. So what the client sees is the client sees something like this. And this is what's presented to them as a self-service option for these applications. Um, it's pretty, and all, this is all customizable. Um, you can deploy. Um, your own banners and your own sidebar links and stuff. So we have help desk and documentation and you know all that kind of stuff on the side. Um, again, I'm probably going to linger too much on this, uh, but on the back end, it's just a set of um, XML um, strings of 
lists of all of the applications and stuff like yeah. Does you have a way to preclude the customer from going to the app store? And yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, the question was uh, just to reiterate is to block the use of the app store. Um, simplest way to do that is through a profile. And Monkey can actually deploy pro profiles through packages. And there's um, I, there's a GitHub project called MCX MCX2 Profile, I think is what it's called. And basically, you you take it in a in a plist, you make the profile and sh and run it through this, and it'll output an actual profile to be applied to the machine. The machine receives as if it was generated from configurator or something like that. Yeah. So then Monkey service is similar to a repository. On yes. System. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's exactly what to think about it is. But you get to define it, and you get yeah. to define, and you can actually get to the point of. I don't know if I actually had this slated to talk about, but it, it's a lot more granular than just self-service. So when I, the way I, I use it is I have my manifest. I get the company manifest. I get the IT manifest. I get the dev manifest. All things have different packages in them, but when I give them to you, they're made available to you to download. Also, there are managed installs. So if you work at this company, you have to have root cert, you have to have this security package, you have to have this power settings, you have to have these. So those are managed installs. So all security patches are managed installs, but flagged for install by date. So you can say, okay, you have to do your security patches, you don't have to do them right away, but you have seven days to do them. So all of that can be controlled through Monkey, um, through a tool to configure Monkey, I should say. So can your Monkey repository be local? Could you make a local repository like you can in Linux? Yeah, yeah. All, all of these I would consider on your local network. Like I, I haven't, because of certain implications with my environment, haven't moved to the cloud at all for this. It's sitting on a, a Linux server where the clients check that URL for the repo and go from there. Um, there's a tool written in PHP called Monkey Report PHP that will work with the monkey code itself um, to pull information from clients. So clients will actually report back all of this information about what's going on with them. Um, you get a nice event stream of who's checked in when, um, any new clients that may have been added to the repository, there's Apple updates pending, any uh, non-Apple updates pending install, disk utilities, I could, I could go on and on. So this is um, author Git. These are modules that are available for monkey report uh, that you can use. Uh, it's just growing in verbosity all the time. All of these are modular in the sense of you can add or remove them as you see fit. If you don't want the crash plan module, don't install it on the client. Just disable it in monkey report and you don't need that information. But all of these different things are available through monitoring through monkey report. So. Um, it's a it's a really great what I would consider piggyback tool on the underlying code that runs as monkey um, yeah monkey report PHP again all these projects will be listed um, for context monkey report PHP just gets installed as a package um, and then is updated whenever the server is updated um, all through monkey so I'm just gonna take a step back and this I think will go kind of along with what you were asking is what does it look like through the whole workflow? Um, so client data is imported into Snipit um, for some similar asset management database. So serial number, who's gonna have it as a user, purchase date, purchase price, whatever. So then we move it on and we say, okay, let's image it, whatever your preference is. You know, full image, I just want the packages, just give me the packages that I need to get me pointed to the proper repository, and then we'll go from there. So then this portion looks something like, okay, I'll just step you through what a client run looks like. So Monkey has pre-flight script, flight script, post-flight script. So pre-flight script says, I'm gonna check these things. We good? Cool, we're gonna go out and check the repository. So it goes up and it pulls down manifests that include what can I install and what do I have to have installed? Or what has to be installed by a certain date? 
So then the client side takes those, those XML files, runs through them through Python and says, okay, these things are available, I have to install them. These things are optionally available, I have to install them. And then these things are just updates. Um, another benefit of Monkey is you can do a managed update, which say Google Chrome came out with an update. You can just have it automatically install on the client machine. They don't have to do anything. If Chrome's closed, it'll do it automatically all in the background. They're none the wiser. Beautiful. Did you have a question over here? Are you good? No? Cool. Um, so pre-flight script runs, script runs, post-flight script runs, does a couple checks. Post-flight is where the monkey report stuff sits. Um, I kind of liken it to uh, Nagios checks in a little, in, 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 in a loose way, that there's a series of bash scripts that sit there for each module. And then it runs through those bash scripts and then takes those values, queues them up, and then sends them off the monkey report. So in that, you could be, if, in theory, if you could write a bash script to return a value, you could create a module in monkey report to have that information available. Everything I've ever wanted has already been made, so I haven't made any custom ones, but it's there, the framework's there, it was designed for that purpose. Um, yeah, and then the client pushes it to Monkey Report. Monkey Report's read only, it doesn't interact with the clients at all, but just receives. It basically takes them, puts it in its database, and says this is the information. Um, cool, so I mentioned Snipe it and its API earlier. Um, what you can do is you can customize that pre-flight script when monkey runs. So implications of that could be that, okay, instead of just checking to make sure my network's on and stuff like that, let's go and check the company database. Okay, my serial number is this. What should my manifest be? Okay, I should be in this manifest, which leads us to the run script. So inherently, that machine is going to run as whatever the database says it should be. So now, with Snipeit or some other database, you have a central point to manage how the Macs see themselves or what manifests they fall into. Um, this is great because if a user changes it, the next time it runs, it's going to change it back. It's, and if you ever need to move the machine from a different manifest, all you have to do is update it in the database. The next time the computer checks in, it's going to update itself to say, hey, I'm in this manifest now, and then receive those applications. Um, uh, an example of something where that could be handy is um, this hypothetical situation of like, say a user changes role in your organization. I'm moving from a um, internship to the media, like the media production team. Well, instead of you having to go pull their machine back, update it in the database. When it checks back in, it's going to say, okay, well, now you can get Adobe CC. Now you can get Dreamweaver. All of those things are now made available to you. And you never had to touch the machine. It's, it makes your life a lot easier. But it doesn't push them out. It can. It, oh, okay. you can. You can set them to do, if you want them to be managed, that would be what I would consider a managed install. Say, like, you have to have... So like managed installs that I go with, like your, your basic office apps, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Remote Desktop, whatever. You know, stuff like that it isn't very big. Well, it is big now, but. Can you do configuration management? Absolutely. Like, like security settings and Monkey, Monkey will not say it is a, conf a configuration management tool. Okay. Can you do it via, so Monkey is a package installer or application installer. So theory, you can put it in a package, you can push it with Monkey. So if you can package it, you can ship it. Okay. I will talk about configuration management though. So here's the caveat. A lot of the package management has to be done on a Mac. You can't package a Mac package on something else. So, and that's just kind of a downside. It doesn't have to be a physical Mac. It can be a virtual machine that runs on a Mac. Because that's part of their EULA. Mac VMs have to run on Macs. You can only have two VMs per machine, regardless of the base machine. Some interpretation may vary. So um, whether it's making a NetBoot image or making a package, it still has to be done on a Mac. So you're not going to get away from it 100%, hence the almost in the, in the session title. But once you have those made, then you can ship them off to whatever, whatever 
way you would like. So here's an example. Say you have a monkey VM that's doing all your package creation, package management. Well, once it's made, you could ship it off to a repo sitting on a server. And then however you disperse it from that, that's up to you. So now once you get it on this host, it's your, it's your Linux tools, whatever you want to use to move them around. As long as the client can reach it, sync thing. Anybody in here ever use sync thing? Great open source project based on Tor. It's awesome, but it'll automatically sync packages, anything, folder directories to other locations. So now you're making one change and it's, get, it's getting deployed out to an entire environment of machines. Um, so these are some of those tools that I like. Um, and these are the tools that are specific to, well, specifically to deploying on Macs that are open source or free that I like. Um, suspicious package is fun. Um, it will actually break down an application and show you all of the things that it installs, all of the scripts that it runs. It's very nice to have. It's quick. Actually, it has a, still has a Finder plugin that you hit the space bar and does a quick look, and then it'll break it, break it down in that, which <laughs> I didn't know people still did it, but they got it. And it's a great, it's a great app, so it lets you dig into it. Um, good for anybody deploying packages to know what it is you're actually deploying. Uh, say you want to make stuff. You want to make stuff internally. There's a couple of different ones. Um, there's packages. Um, which is just a Mac app to create and deploy packages. Uh, there's also a command line tool called uh, the Luggage, which um, I didn't include on here, that does the same exact thing, just no GUI. So whatever you're responsible for. Um, Git and GitLab for version tracking, um, You know whatever you're allowed to do if it needs to be internal and regulated or if you just want to push your stuff up. Uh, there's a lot of, I would say, majority of the Mac admins out there, if they've made a recipe or they've made something that they feel is viable to the community, it's on their Git repo. Like there's so much good stuff out there in the community. So even if you're not a Mac admin and you're trying to do something to some some machines in your fleet, more than likely somebody else has already done it. It's on GitHub for sure. Um, so this next section I'm gonna break into are some uh, other open source free tools. Uh, that I think are work, worth looking into. Like if you're just jotting stuff down, of like, hey, I want to read up on this, or I want to look at it later, um, or I need to, you know, do this in my environment. Uh, these are just some additional ones that um, I'm pretty stoked on watching, um, without getting too in depth. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is Micro MDM. Um, how many in here are familiar with uh, an MDM service? for Apple stuff? Okay, cool. So micro MDM is a current, currently in development, I think it's a version 0.4, um, and it's being developed to be an open source MDM server. So for those of you who don't know what this is, basically that means that I can go to Apple and say, hey Apple, I wanna be an enterprise level developer. Okay, here's my so much money a year, give me access to that. Okay, so now what I can do is the paid MDM um, services, uh, Jamf, for example, you pay them so much a machine to be able to use this MDM service that ties into Apple. That's coming open source. If people are making that available to us um, developers in a really big way. So this, I, I think imaging is gone, MDM is the future. Um, a quick run through what MDM does is if you're an organization, you have a DEP number through Apple, you tie your account to them. So if I purchase a machine from any of my resellers, it knows that when I purchase that machine, it belongs to my organization and it's tied into it. So when that machine boots up for the first time, gotta love Apple, it checks into Apple. Phone home, right? So it says, hey, I'm checking in, who do I belong to? If you have nothing configured, it doesn't really do anything. But if you have this config, yeah. Well, doesn't that assume you have to put the serial number in your? No, this is completely, this is a whole nother topic. Like MDM is baked into the operating system. DEP is baked into the operating system of Apple. Every Apple machine is going to check into Apple as soon as it boots. Right, but how does it know it belongs to you? because you purchased the machine through a vendor, right. 
that has your information. So you are applied a number. They put, they put the serial number in. So you, as yeah, you. it's all it's all automated. But yeah, okay. essentially, right. I say I it's the, say I go down to the Mac store here in town and I buy it on my company card. They're gonna say, okay, this serial number belongs to this company, and then Apple knows it. So, okay. so what happens then is when it checks, it checks in. It says, hey, do I need anything? So if you had it goes to Apple and says, hey, do you, have, do, you need, do I need anything? Am I good? Like, is there an MDM for this? So if, you're, if you pay Jam or you pay some other company, <coughs> they can say, like, okay, you get these packages. These are your initial configurations, et cetera. So what this allows you to do is you get to be the person that determines all of that. I want to get these packages installed. I want these configs installed. And it's all you, and it's all controlled by you. Um, and it's all open source, which is awesome. So... Definitely not deployment ready, but flag it, follow it on GitHub. Super cool things coming. Uh, there's a question earlier about config management. Uh, I think Salt Stack was the one in question. Um, Puppet Chef. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dig into those. They're there. I hear people do great things with both of them. Definitely more config specific. I'm talking kind of more software, but definitely worth investigating if there's. If you really need to get granular about it, um, I'll just leave it there because that's a whole other can of worms. I'm um, another one. Uh, Nomad currently broke version one. Uh, it's on Git. What this does is this allows you to. Uh, this is probably the app school of people that are in a Windows environment or directory environment. Um, it, you don't actually have to bind the machine to gain the privileges of what binding does. So Kerberos certs, certificates, stuff like that. It's all managed through this application without actually binding at the OS level. So that sound, if your ears perked up for that, then definitely worth um, checking it out. Another one is a project from Facebook called OS Query. Um, OS Query, uh, I don't know if I can summarize it in one sentence, but um, it basically allows you to run it looks at your system as a database and allows you to query against your system for pretty much whatever information you would want to know. Um, installed applications, known, known kernel extensions, uh, yeah, so much stuff. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit more later. Um, another really great open source project um, that's out, they won't say that they're version one yet, um, but I would say they're probably pretty close, is Google Santa. And Santa is a binary whitelisting and blacklisting application for Mac OS. And basically, if you are in an environment that says, OK, you can only run applications A, B, and C, this would be something that you could say, OK, these are the known, these are the known binaries that are allowed to run on this machine. Past that, nothing runs. If that's your environment, then it might be useful. There's also the other side of it where you can um, only blacklist certain applications. So if there's known vulnerabilities or known applications or you're having trouble with runaway Spotify usage, you could do something like that too. <laughs> so so um, one of the last tools I'll, uh, I'm going to talk about um, is Ventral. Um, Ventral is currently not in production, but definitely worth a follow and a watch. Um, I would say it's, you could definitely throw it in your dev environment and mess around with it. Um, but what the guy, the folks that work on Ventral are looking to do is integrate a lot of these open source tools that are available to the Mac, the Mac admin community and put them in a place that you can see them all at the same time. So if you look at it kind of like, this is straight off their Git, um, definitely worth a read. This project is incredible. Um, if, even if you, you know, manage 20 machines, this might be something worth looking at. Um, so if you look at it and break it down, um, your Santa config controls your binary uh, whitelist or blacklist. OS query is gathering information about your machine. Um, Monkey dumps its post-flight data out, which I gave the example of Monkey report, but it could be to a file, it could be to a database. Um, and then that gets forwarded on into Zentral. Um, Zentral actually has built-in download links. Once you install the instance in your environment, we'll give you a custom installer for your clients. It'll point them to it, and it'll go through. So it'll, it can watch inventories. Um, it can also 
work through visualizations. The dashboards are pretty, pretty basic right now, but you can submit any kind of query you would through OS query to show up on your dashboard. And then from there, you can actually trigger actions, um, whether you get a notification in a Slack channel or um, you do an API call to something. Um, it's it's, it's going to be really awesome. Um, for somebody that uses a fraction of the tools that are available, I'm still really stoked on it. So um, it's, a, it's a really great open source project. Um, yeah, so those were, the, those were those tools again. Um, yeah, right on. Um, I would consider myself a Mac admin because my main role is Apple Systems Administrator. Um, there's a channel on Slack, not channel, it's a team, and it's just called Mac Admins. Um, if you go to macadmins.org, it'll redirect you to the Heroku app to enroll. Um, if you don't use Slack um, or if you um, have never used it, it's really easy to get into. Um, and this is a great place. It's it's the what I would consider the new IRC. Like it's there's probably about ten thousand Mac admins from around the world that sit on this in different channels and different things. Um, man, it is a great, great, incredible resource on top of these resources. The guys, the girls, the folks that make these apps sit in these channels all day. Like I had a question about Monkey Report and I got to talk, although not be it directly because he's not even close to our time zone, the main dev on Monkey Report. So it was like, it's really awesome and you can integrate, with, uh, integrate this with a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I, I highly recommend it, macadmins.org. Please, please check it out. It's if you have any questions, it's a great place, a great place to find information. Um, so I don't really use Mac OS to manage Mac OS. I use a mix of Linux servers and Python applications and things like that. And I think it's very accessible. I think it's now now it's easier than it ever was. Um, I think I think that man. I hear, what I hear a lot in the, in the Slack channel is it's such a great time to be a Mac admin, which I find really, really funny saying at a Linux conference. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, like, I don't know your environment. Like, you're all here, so evidently you have some interest or desire or need for some tool here. So, um, cool. That's what I had for now. Um, I wanted to leave some time for some Q&A. I know I had a lot of, like, a lot of different topics. So I just wanted to like leave 10 minutes, open it up. I don't know everything. I know what I know and I, I don't know what I don't know. So there's that. Um, and I'm also, when I post the slides, I have a couple pages of just straight links to these projects. So don't, you know, don't, if you don't remember it or you need a link or something, they'll all be on the project or on the presentation. Yeah. User clicks a link. Oh, download um, Adobe Reader, which you don't want on that machine. Sure. Can you control that or not? Sure. So that's assuming that you gave the user administrative privileges. So if you gave the user administrative privileges, there's not a lot you can do. That would yeah. probably be where Santa came into effect with the binary whitelist, blacklist kind of thing. So it would be blocked by Santa. Yeah. Yeah. That runs at the OS level and then or at, the, at the kernel level, and it'll just, you'll basically blacklist the ones you don't want to be able to run. And then when they try to run, they'll get a, they'll get a they'll message. Get, they'll get a message. Um, so for sure. So to install for managed software, do users have to be an admin, like the app store? No, so that's a great question, thank you. Um, to use something like Managed Software Center in Monkey, the users don't need admin privileges. The Monkey tool itself will run as admin, but it, which means the users don't have to, uh, which, is really, which is really cool. Um, Santa came out of uh, a mindset, and speaking off of a talk I heard maybe two years ago, that they, they were fine giving all of their users admin privileges, and they wanted to pursue a different avenue for blocking applications and binaries. So if you're in an, if you're in an environment where you don't give your users admin privileges, that's, di that's a completely different topic. So just a little bit of context around Santa. Yeah? So if you, um, you have a one more session as a full user view to one workstation, how would, um, how would the monkey manifest work uh, as far as the, the different applications one so this is where it breaks down. Um, Monkey is a machine-based manifest. 
So a machine inherits a manifest. So whatever that machine gets, that machine gets. So regardless of what user you log into, Monkey doesn't care. Because it's only checking in as that user. So just like on Mac OS, um, assuming no special privileges modifications were made, if you log in on a machine that has any application installed, it's going to be available to any user on the machine. So it, it assumes that any application that gets, is allowed to be installed on the machine is allowed for any user that's there and allowed on that machine, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right on. Cool. Yeah. So unfortunately, I inherited an environment that's actually all on um, Mac server, open directory, and everything. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> um, so, would any of these tools, Monkey, something like that? And so, it's about a hundred users. So, a lot of this also happens to do high touch going to their file systems to make some changes, stuff like that. Um, what any of these or any other tools you might recommend that would make that a lot easier than, say, using Remotix and anything like that? Like, yeah. No, I think you are, and we can talk more after this. Mm -hmm. I think you are you are prime game for some of this. Now, are a lot of your is that your whole, like, I don't want to, you don't have to divulge this information if you don't want to about your network, but um, the things this doesn't account for, this is mostly application user management. This isn't network services, so like your directory services, your, you know, TCP, stuff like that, I didn't really take into consider, consideration with. Mm -hmm. But as far as the application deployment and stuff goes, if you have application deployment and actually so something they use because it's a network Mac environment that like to break a lot of things um, something they share a lot is photos and a lot of times what happens is from one in one someone might create a photo and then just randomly will get locked and so we'll have to go in and edit permissions on that machine and unlock them for the share and that means sure. in our instances we have to actually go manually connect to that machine change it um, so we're kind of looking is there a way to have some sort of service where we're able to... There's a lot of layers to that yeah. question. Yeah. A lot of layers to that question, which we can talk more about after if you want to come up and hang out. Yeah, because there's definitely... Actually, you mentioned something in my VSS curriculum earlier. Um, you were talking about server integration and... Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that would be like, a, are your machines bound? And if so, are they bound to your... You said they're bound to your OD, and mm -hmm. is where does the file share sit? Yeah, there's a lot of different questions, so but... Is that like for me as a yeah. to how to get... Yeah. Nomad. Get outside of that particular scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. Cool. If there's nothing else, hey, have a great conference. Thanks for coming.